All right, there we go. So we'll begin with this first question. Uh, dear Rabbi Lu, should Jewish people celebrate Valentine's Day? Uh, Todah, have a great day. Okay, so the question is, should Jewish people celebrate Valentine's Day? Great question. And I dare I expand this question to the other holidays that there are. Should we celebrate other secular holidays? Um, even though some say that this is a religious holiday. So let me, let me first speak about a specific answer by Rabbi Moshe Iserles. He was one of the great European rabbis who uh, also annotated the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, uh, to add the Ashkenazic version of the Jewish law, whenever there's a difference between the Sephardic Jews and Ashkenazic Jews. But Rabbi Moshe Isseles, being an expert on Jewish law, speaks about some um, questions one may ask, one should ask, before he jumps to celebrate a holiday that is not Jewish. One of the questions is, does it have origins in idol worship? Because if it does, and we stay as far away as idol worship as possible, then we should stay away from that holiday too. Another question that he asks is that, does this holiday also have any, um, um, any Jewish hatred involved in it? Sometimes these are holidays, you know, for 2000 years they persecuted us. And uh, some of these holidays might have any, uh, might have had some semblance of Jewish hatred in them. If that's the case, then we should stay away from them too. Anyway, so there's questions that he asks in order to know whether one can celebrate a holiday that's not Jewish or not. Now, uh, specifically about Valentine's Day, I'm not too familiar with the origins of Valentine's Day. I understand that it was started maybe by uh, one of the popes in the year, I think 450 or 500 CE in order to honor a martyr by the name of Valentine who uh, also performed a miracle <clears throat> by, um, I don't even know, making, I think he's jailer's daughter uh, that was blind, making her see again. Um, and um, he even wrote her a letter apparently and signed his name Valentine, a love letter. So to honor him, who might have been martyr on this day, uh, a person who was full of love, uh, we celebrate Valentine's Day, a day of love. That I think is the origin. And again, I may be uh, wrong, but from my readings, I think that's the origin. Now, does that, this, uh, this is origin have any, any semblance of Jewish hatred? Not necessarily. Does it have idol worship in it? Not necessarily. Still, is it a holiday that we should celebrate? I don't know. I don't know because of two reasons. Reason number one is because I think that the way we celebrate love, Jews celebrate love, and the way uh, no, this holiday celebrates love is very different. We celebrate love not by uh, celebrating love itself, but we celebrate love by celebrating relationships Re and, and good lasting relationships. Um, we don't celebrate love just for love. Uh, and, you know, Tu Be'av, for example, is our day of love, the 15th of Av. And that's when we celebrate the beginning, the bud of new relationships between husband and wife. And, and I think there's, there's a reason why we celebrate relationships and not hi. the concept of love itself. That is because love that does not translate into something that's realistic. Okay. And, yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. No, no problem. <laughs> I need to mute though. I, love I am, I am, I am. I love it. <laughs> I like to see okay. the baby. But I'm saying, the, the reason we don't celebrate the concept of love, or at least we don't dedicate a whole day to the concept of love itself, because we don't believe too much in emotions, emotions that don't translate into realistic and lasting relationships or actions, then are really not worth much. And therefore, when we do celebrate our day of love, we celebrate relationships because we focus so much more on action in Judaism and we focus so much more on lasting actions. That's number one. But number two, and I'm speaking now as a French Jew. Valentine's Day doesn't ring a good bell, a uh, uh, sweet bell for French Jews and maybe for Jews altogether. Because Valentine's Day in the year 1349, to be exact, was a day in which uh, the Jewish community of Strasbourg, Strasbourg in France was massacred. You may have learned that 
uh, during those years, right? I'm speaking about 1349. From 1347, for a few good years, uh, the Black Death, the, the, that plague, the Black Death spread across Europe. It probably came from Central Asia. It came first to Italy, and then from Italy it spread throughout Europe. A plague that killed uh, astonishing numbers of people. Some say 100 million people in Europe altogether. Some say even 150 million uh, uh, people in Europe. 60% of European population was killed by this plague. Now, of course, people blame the Jew. The Jew, the Jew who was dirty, the Jew infected those wells from which that plague erupted, um, was blamed. And because the Jew was blamed, so many, many Jew haters decided to launch pogroms. Mobs of evil people would come and slaughter entire communities. There's stories about how the community of Mainz, for example, in Germany, was slaughtered in one day, just in one day. All the Jews were killed because they were blamed because of the, the, this, this terrible plague. Or some uh, in Cologne, Germany, Cologne, Jews were put in the synagogue and the whole synagogue was set on fire. In Strasbourg, on Friday, February 13th, 1349, Jews were assembled, were forced out of their homes by armed people, forced and were assembled all together in the Jewish cemetery of Strasbourg. And uh, they were forced to convert. Jews who refused to convert were told that they had to stay in the cemetery for the night, the next morning on Shabbat, knowing that this is a holiday for Jews. February 14th, 1349, Valentine's Day, 1349, all these Jews who, who and most of them, I, I, I even believe that all of them refused to convert, all of these Jews were massacred on the spot. And they uh, were asked to assemble in the cemetery so that they could create their mass grave right there and then. So Valentine's Day for French Jews is actually a very, very sad day. It's a day of mourning. It's a day in which the entire community, Jewish community of Strasbourg was murdered. So it's not a day of celebration whatsoever. So that's another reason to add of why Jews really don't really celebrate Valentine's Day. Now, it doesn't mean that if you celebrate Valentine's Day that you're a bad person. It doesn't mean that if you celebrate Valentine's Day and you celebrate the concept of love and it enhances the love in your relationship that, you know, again, you're a bad person. No, fine, let it be. But I'm just speaking here again from a Jewish perspective. So that, that's regarding Valentine's Day. Next question. So, wondering if you could talk about Pirkei Avot, Ethics of Our Fathers. Khan had mentioned that it was a favorite thing to study. Okay, so um, just again, a very quick background to the Ethics of Our Fathers. The Ethics of Our Fathers is really one of the many books in the six volumes of the Mishnah that we have, Shisha Sidre Mishnah. The Mishnah basically was, was compiled by Rabbi Yehuda Nasi of the year 100 CE, more or less, who came to compile all of the discussions of the sages before him, of the Mishnahic sages, from the year about 200 BC until the year 100 CE, say, uh, the discussion that deal with Jewish law. The Torah tells us many laws, 613 commandments altogether, but very often it doesn't tell us the details of those laws. So the sages really discuss those details of the law. And Rabbi Yehuda Nasi came and compiled all of those laws into six volumes that are called the Mishnah. The Mishnah is really a guide to the 613 commandments of the Torah. One of those books is a book of ethics. Maybe that's why in English it's called the Ethics of Our Fathers. Ethics and Morals of Judaism. That book is called Pirkei Avot, the chapters of our fathers. Now, the chapters meaning the morals and the values that they pass down to us, that those fathers pass down to us. There is a collection of many, many tremendous teachings. And I would encourage anyone and everyone to read from those teachings. And um, many of these teachings are truly eternal. They apply to us today as they applied to Rabbi Yudha Nasi 1900 years ago. They apply to all times and to all people. Uh, Rabbi Steinsaltz himself had translated this book into Chinese. And um, the Chinese people love it. They also feel that it's very aligned with their values and morals. Um, not talking about the Chinese government, I'm talking about the Chinese people. That's a different story. 
not many morals there are there. But uh, um, so that's, that's, that's how much of an impact this book has had on our world. Maybe to quote a few of the teachings of the Pirkavot, <clears throat> one of my favorite ones is one that, that ought to be remembered each and every day because our society tries to, to teach us the opposite of this teaching. What is this teaching that is one of my favorites? It's in the name of Ben Zoma who says, Ezo Ashir, who is rich, Asamach Lechelko, one who is happy with his lot. Who is wise, one who, who learns from everyone. Who is respected, one who respects others. And the fourth one is, who is, remind me, anyone? Who is well respected, wise, wealthy, and come on. Okay, I remember, but I'm going to get to the fourth one when we remember it. But it's one of my favorite teachings because what it does is that it takes ideas that our society preaches belong only to the selected few and makes those ideas really the property of all. So, for example, wisdom. If you ask someone who is wise, well, you have to have seven PhDs. You have to have, uh, you know, this title before your name and that title after your name. Fine. But here comes and uh, Ben Zoma and says, who is wise? If you learn from every person, you don't need to have seven PhDs. Then you're, you're wise. Same with the wealthy. Who is wealthy? Not someone who's on the Forbes list each and every year, but quite the opposite. Someone who's happy with his lot, satisfied with what he has. Okay, takes the property of the few in our society and makes the property of everybody. Who is, um, who is respected? Not people of political power or other types of power, but again, if you respect others, you respect it. Rabbi Eisen, thank you for reminding me of the fourth one. Who is Gibog, who is strong? And the uh, um, Mishnah again says, one who is able to conquer his own inclinations. Akoveshet Yitzro. If you ask someone today who is strong, is someone that lifts, you know, 500 pounds each day and uh, does 700 push-ups and who knows what. That's not who's strong. Napoleon is not strong. Um, you know, Alexander the Great was not strong. According to Judaism, you know who's strong? One who's able to conquer his own self, his own inclination. That's a person that's stronger than, a person, than warriors that may conquer many cities. Now, uh, again, takes the property of the few and makes it the property of, of, of everyone and anyone. Anyway, so that's one of the teachings. Again, the many, many, many other teachings and ethics of our fathers that are certainly worth learning and again and again and again. Okay, next question. Rabbi. Yes. <laughs> yes, George. <clears throat> Out of all these, these four teachings, it seems to me so often children have these teachings yeah in some way they they have a wisdom uh they have a strength um you know they 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 have a respect you know and they are rich right they are rich in simplicity and and who they are in our world Right. And so it just don't, it just felt like that to me that we think only of adults, but sometimes ch I think children have all these four beautiful teachings. They're very good. Uh, absolutely. They're much more in tune with those teachings than adults are. Absolutely. You're right. Very good. Very good. Okay. All right. Next question. Could you please talk about kosher fish? I think it's related to fins and scales. I was wondering specifically about anchovies and shellfish in general. So, <laughs> all right, well, anchovies are kosher, shellfish are not. I'm gonna speak about this, but you're right. Kosher fish are related to fins and scales because we know if a fish is kosher or if it's not kosher based on what the Torah tells us. What does the Torah tell us? The Torah tells us that a fish that has both fins and scales is a fish that's kosher fish that doesn't have fins or scales or only has one of them is not kosher. That's how we know which fish are kosher and which fish are not. By the way, the Talmud says something that just is astounding because the Talmud again was compiled some 2000 years ago. And until today, this truth remains. 
which means that uh, today, you know, after so many scientific studies have been performed on fish, so many new species of fish have been discovered. Still, what the Talmud says remains true. What does the Talmud say? say? That all fish that have scales will have fins. Some fish have fins, but won't have scales. But if you see a fish with scales, it means that it has fins. Now, 2,000 years later, this remains a scientific truth. It's true. And even though, again, millions of new fish have been discovered, still we find that what the Talmud says is true, that if you find a fish that has scales, you'll find fins attached to it. Now, it could be that it has fins, but doesn't have scales. And then again, that makes the fish not kosher. But all fish that have scales have fins and, and uh, therefore are kosher. Now, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into this uh, because there's a beautiful Hasidic discourse I, I once studied um, by the late Lubavitcher Rebbe Rav Schneerson, who, who was obsessed with taking every teaching that may seem a little primitive and making it so relevant and so, so enriching for our day-to-day -day life. And he takes this concept of what makes a fish kosher and teaches us that this really has been the key of Jewish survival for thousands of years. This idea that fish needed, need fins and need scales. Why? Why has this been, this been the idea for Jewish survival for so many years? And he explains that really because fins and scale year, scales here symbolize something much deeper. What keeps us kosher? Fins and scales. What are scales? Scales come to protect the fish. They come to ensure that the fish has a thick skin, so to speak, so that it's almost immune to any penetration from the outside. Fins are what make the fish move forward, right? Swim. Go ahead. Now, the Jewish world has been really divided with, with, with this specific question for maybe 300 years now. Should we work on bettering our scales or should we work on our progress forward, on swimming to the next big thing? And here we've had two voices in the Jewish world. One Jewish voice has said, well, Jews need to have thick skin and therefore let's enclose ourselves in ghettos. Doesn't matter if, if we'll stay you know, back in time, if we want to progress with society, but at least our skin will be so thick that nothing from the outside will be able to penetrate. So there was the, 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 the method or the approach of scales. Let's call this method rabbi scales. Then you had Dr. Finns. Dr. Finns who said, no, we don't need scales. Forget about it. It's time that Jews progress, move forward, that we live with the times, that we modernize ourselves. It's enough living in ghettos. It's enough focusing too much on our scales, on our Torah. Finally, the world is open to us. Let's go. Let's swim in it. And Dr. Finn said, no, first go to the Ivy League schools, then go to the, get yourself PhDs, then swim and make sure you know Socrates and Plato before you know Rabbi Akiva and Hillel. Now the question is, who's right? And here comes again, the brilliant Lubavitcher Rebbe and says, well, we need both. We need scales. We need a thick skin. We need to remember that we are Jewish and we have to protect that identity and at the same time also enrich and develop that identity. But we also need to be engaged with the world. We need indeed to swim forward. Yes, technology is not an enemy if it's used in the right way. The Ivy League schools are not enemies if it can again move us, propel us forward in our own spiritual journey. We have to be engaged with the world with those fins. We have to move forward, but at the same time, not forget to develop our scales. So that's a deeper idea about an idea that I love really. And it's so relevant and so beautiful. And of course, so true that I love from the Lubavitch Rebbe that we can learn again from fish that need both scales and fins to be kosher. Okay. And then next question for today. All right, we'll conclude with this one. It's apropos because as we all know, next week uh, on Thursday evening is Purim, Thursday evening and Friday. And the question is as follows, dear rabbi, what is the single most important lesson that you learned from the story of Purim? Okay, the single most important lesson from the story, the story of Purim. Well. 
the many lessons from the story of Purim, but I'll share one. Maybe, maybe it's the single most important, and that's not because I said, but because many commentaries point to this lesson. So just to, to give the background first, for those who are not familiar, the story of Purim is a story in which we faced maybe the first final solution in Jewish history where the evil advisor of the king Ahasuerus, who ruled over 127 countries, wanted to murder the Jewish people simply because he hated Jews. Now, um, Mordechai, who was the leader of the Jewish people at the time, had a niece by the name of Esther, a beautiful name, especially that it's my wife's name, so it's the most beautiful name. But, and I hope she hears this recording afterwards. But, or maybe you can point it out to her that I mentioned it so that I get extra points, all right? But, in any case, Esther, the niece of Mordechai, is convinced by her uncle to infiltrate the palace and to present herself as a candidate for the next queen after Akashvirosh had abolished, made his previous queen disappear. The Midrash says that she was executed. Anyhow, Queen uh, uh, Esther agrees. She is chosen as the next queen. Now they have a Jewish representative that's concealed as a Jew, but it's still a very proud Jew in the palace. And when the advisor, Haman, issues this decree to kill the entire nation of Jews, then the queen approaches Ahasuerus to make a very long story short, convinces him to not just annul the decree, but also he's so livid that Haman dead murder uh, the Jewish people and the queen among them, of course, that he decides to kill Haman and his 10 sons who were part of the plot. So the story of Purim is a story in which we see that there was a terrible decree of the, on the Jewish people, a decree that if it was carried out, we wouldn't be here this evening speaking. And it was turned around almost miraculously through natural events or so-called so seeming natural events. It was turned around and the Jewish people eventually were not only victorious, but their enemies were wiped out. Uh, by the way, Mordechai eventually took the place of Haman and he became the advisor of the king instead. Now, what's the single most important lesson to the story? I think the single most important lesson to the story is that at the end of the day, God is in charge. We may see the world in a very limited way, but God sees the entire picture. And sometimes when we are locked into this limited picture that we see, we just have to trust that there is a master that only, not only sees the entire picture, but also creates the entire picture. And he knows what he's doing. And my limited view of my limited picture might evoke many fears and insecurities in me because all I'm seeing is complete blackness, dark. I still have to believe that the picture is being created by someone who knows how to lead me towards the light, but someone who sees and creates that entire picture and will eventually make it known to me. And that I think is the reason why we disguise ourselves on Purim, to teach us that what we see is not what there is. Even though, yes, we are in this pandemic and things have been many, for, for so many people, very, very disruptive to say the least in the past year, we have to believe again in this specific context that God is in charge and God knows what he's doing. And as the Tanya, the famous book that we study each and every Sunday morning at 7.15 a.m. and all are welcome, as the Tanya famously says, Ein ra yored milemala. no bad can come down from above. Sometimes we are not privy to seeing the good, but it doesn't mean that it's not good. And we have to believe again that there is a master, a chief conductor that is able really to, to ensure that the outcome eventually will be good. And hopefully that outcome that is good will also be shown to us. During the story of Purim, most Jews thought that's it. Imagine living during those times. That's it, I'm gonna die. I mean, Haman is the all powerful advisor. Achashverosh has his back. We're gonna die. Yes, we're praying, yes, we're fasting. We're gonna die. It's written on the wall already. And yet from the natural events themselves, a miracle appears and God emerges in, in the most unannounced places, in the most unexpected ways. And there he is rescuing the Jewish people 
and turning the tables around altogether. And we have to believe that this is what is happening each and every day, when challenge after challenge, when we face pediments and obstacles, we must know that God is there carrying our hand. Uh, you know, there, there's Auschwitz. No, I don't think it was in Auschwitz. I think it was in a cellar in Cologne, to be more exact. During the war, uh, many Jews were kept crammed into the cellar. After the war, someone went back to visit it, and he saw an inscription on the wall, on the walls that was obviously inscribed or engraved by one of these um, Jews who were tortured. And the inscription read that I believe in love, even though I may not feel it. I believe in the sun, even though it is not shining. And I believe in God, even though he may be silent. Again, there is so much more to what we see. So much more happening than what we can grasp. And we have to believe that God, again, is in charge. Now, I'll conclude with this. Maybe this idea, which, again, shares the most important lesson of Purim, in my humble opinion, but, of course, in the opinion of so many other commentaries. And that's the story of um, the Opium War in 1840. <clears throat> it's amazing. I, I think I shared it in my happiness hour last week. But in 1840, there was an opium war between Great Britain and uh, China. And it was bloodshed and there was tension among countries and the economy went, go it went down the drain. And if you lived in 1840, uh, you would think, oh gosh, here's another war. It's just, just a waste. Anyway, in 1842, there was a treaty signed that put an end to this war and that treaty turned Shanghai a city in China into an international city. Fine. Fast forward 100 years, Jews are now stuck in Europe. They are completely uh, ambushed by, by the evil of the Nazis. And they have nowhere to go except for one city, Shanghai, who had turned into an international city 100 years ago thanks to the Opium War. 60,000 Jews fled to that city. Today, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of survivors because they had a city to go to. So in 1840, no one knew why this was happening. No one knew what's the point. And year, 100 years later, God showed us, showed the world, international city that is welcoming Jews thanks to this opium war. So sometimes we're in the midst of our own personal wars, our own personal struggles. But in the midst of those struggles, we have to believe that there is a God in charge and that he's orchestrating everything, this entire picture that we may not be able to see for our best interest to the best, for the best outcome, because there is no bad that can come from above.